Good morning, Chair. Good morning. Uh, are we good to go? It's off. Well, it's, we've got three minutes. Okay. BK, you will let me know when we are. Okay. In, in, in route to start. Um, okay. I'll do that. Yeah. All right. All right, uh, good morning, colleagues. It's half past nine. Uh, BK is honorable mentor online. Uh, uh, I haven't seen her yet. And honorable Tulashi. Not yet. We've got yourself, uh, Mam Sibula, Mr. Dex, and Ms. Van Minen, and uh, Mr. Hadeve. The next five. All right, please just check, All right, just check for me. I need to... As long as Honorable Hadeve is here, we're good to go. <laughs> <laughs> I just check for those two for me. Uh, Pepe will start shortly, Honorable Minister. Uh, I just need to... I just need those two members online, but they will be leading the hearing and then we'll be good to go. Right, 
Okay, <clears throat> colleagues, good morning. Um, let me welcome you to um, our meeting this morning with the National Skills Fund, uh, wherein we'll be having a hearing into their financials. Um, and um, we'll be, uh, I would like to welcome the Minister, uh, Minister Zimande. Uh, I'm not sure if the Deputy Minister is here, if the Deputy but that Minister was a long is decision here. Taking. Okay. Uh, so the Deputy and then Minister has the sent DG. an apology, sorry. Okay, the apology of the Deputy Minister uh, is noted. And then we, of course, welcome the Director General of the Department of Higher Education and Training. Um, Minister, we are having this hearing because, well, the state of affairs into the National Skills Fund is one of serious concern. And there have been regressions which uh, have raised the eye of the committee, really. And we have received a briefing from the um, Auditor General. And of course, as you'll recall, we had a discussion about this uh, some few months ago. Um, and so we felt it important then that we look into um, the state of affairs really um, at the National Skills Fund. Um, and so we are quite hopeful then that we are in a position um, today to actually get the necessary answers um, from the uh, department uh, and the National Skills Fund itself. So we've structured today in the form of a hearing, which I'm sure the minister is all fair with. Um, and then what we will do is honorable men, they will be first off the bat. Um, and then Mamdulashe will take the second section um, of, of, of the hearing. But what before we start, um, I'm going to hand over to the minister to make introductory remarks. Um, and then at the end of it, the minister will also have an opportunity to come back in. We are noting the fact that in 2015, 16, 16, 17, and 17, 18, you had unqualified with findings. And then in 2018, 19, you were qualified. And then in 19, 20, you had an adverse um, audit outcome. And the AG has raised some almost 10 issues, really, um, which require. So on that call, colleagues, we will get the minister to give introductory remarks and let us know who is here. And then, Honorable Mente, at the, once the minister is done with his brief introduction, you will then um, have, take it from there. Uh, I won't come in unless there's absolutely something necessary. I'd like to welcome the HE and the SIU, um, our stakeholders um, in the work um, that we do. Uh, I'm prepared to over to you and if you can hand over, uh, also introduce who, who is here part uh, of your team. Over to you, Minister. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Honorable Chairperson of SCOPA, uh, Mr. Shengwa, uh, and thank you to the honorable uh, members of SCOPA and other invited uh, participants and guests. I am in the main year joined by the Director General of the Department of Higher Education and Training, who is also the Accounting Authority of the National Skills Fund in terms of the Skills Development Act, as well as uh, the Chief Executive, Mr. Mfuisi Matsugam of uh, the National Skills Fund. And then I'm joined by my advisors, uh, Mr. Ngaba Mandela, uh, Professor Derek Swartz, uh, Mr. David Nidri, and uh, Ms. Tulihadeb, uh, who I have invited so that also they can listen together with me as you go through this here in chair, as well as my chief of staff in my office. Chair, I just thank you very much for giving me an opportunity to make some opening remarks. I won't be long. 
I just want to make a, 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 some five or six key points and then I'm happy thereafter to listen to the proceedings. And maybe if need be at the end, I may request you chair to say something briefly, of course, that's entirely up to you in case there is a need. Firstly, I just want to put it up front in front of this committee that I welcome the fact that you are having this hearing in your role, authority, <clears throat> as COPA. On my side, I want to be uh, upfront also that I've been concerned about the deteriorating state of affairs in the National Skills Fund for some time now, as evidenced by the progressively worse audit outcomes over the last few years. In fact, if one just goes to the Auditor General's findings, the 2020-2021 audit opinion, my concern also is that it's significantly different to the qualified 2019-2020 audit opinion. In that, what the Auditor General is basically saying is that the NSF has failed in its duty to keep records, evidencing its skills development expenditure. Absent this evidence, the Auditor General is saying it cannot express an opinion on the financial statements of the NSF and is thus unable to give an audit assurance that the NSF skills development expenditure was regular. Much more serious, Auditor General is basically saying, can't say whether the money was spent for what it was supposed to have been allocated for. It's a very serious finding, I take it seriously. Now, Chair, what I also want to inform the committee about is that it's been clear to me just from last year's uh, audit outcome that there is something not going right in the NSF. And it was for this reason. I want to inform this committee that I then initiated a process from last year uh, for a complete review of the NSF covering everything from its business model, its business process or operational processes, its governance structures, its decision-making processes, and everything about the NSF. Of course, it's not an investigation, it's a review because I've been concerned about this. I've also raised this with the NSF. Uh, well, the process, has only then just started early this year when I finally appointed, caref after careful consideration, a three-person review committee, which they've started work uh, recently, as I finalized this early in the year. Given this pending review also, I do need to point out to the Honorable Chair and Honorable members that out of a concern of not wanting to commit the NSF to large contracts that may be affected by the outcome of this review, I have also directed that the National Skills Fund should not enter into any contracts of more than a million rands without engagement and approval by myself. Given the, the outcome of this audit, this has indeed proven to have been a prudent approach out of this concern. In other words, what I'm saying is that not only have I been concerned, I had also, I've also now taken these two actions, a review, instituted a comprehensive review, and secondly said, anything more than a million must come by me. I must also indicate that when, when SCOPA was supposed to deal with this matter at the meeting where you dealt with the NESFAS Honorable Chair, you also had an initial engagement, brief as it was, uh, on the NSF. What I also want to say, at that, until that time, I was not aware that there were interactions between the NSF and the Auditor General trying to question some of the findings of the AG. I only learned about that for the first time at that meeting, which you will recall. 
a couple of months ago, which is a matter also that I've been concerned about because I don't know why as the executive authority, there would be such toing and froing involving the auditor general, the accountant general and the treasury without at least being informed that there's such a process. Of course, it was not me who was going to engage in such a process, but I should actually have known which then enabled me to begin to ask some questions afterwards, because I have already had a meeting with the DG and the CE of uh, the NSF on these particular audit outcomes, including as soon as it was as last week, uh, when I was a week or two ago. Now, indeed the nature of many of the findings are of grave concern. I'm not gonna be defensive especially given that such matters arise out of firstly, basic operational and operational deficiencies such as record keeping and document management, which by the way, are some of the things that the, the, the review must look into. And that also there's been a, a, a regression. I have also raised this that I'm concerned that the NSF continues to operate in outmoded ways. That is what I want also the review to look into for your information chain, which continues to place it at great risk, especially in this day and age of modern ICT systems, you know, that needs to be put in place. The CITAS, for instance, are not perfect, but some of them have got relatively advanced ICT systems because the NSF is also doing work not too dissimilar to the work that is done by the CITAS. Now, in saying all this in my, in my, I am not there for chair, and of course I have no such powers. I'm not there for saying I'm prescribing Scopa to make its own findings, observations, and recommendations, not at all. The fact that there's a review committee in place should not be an obstacle to any other decision that might be taken. And I thought that I actually needed to say this upfront as the executive authority. And uh, I'm looking forward to hearing uh, how the committee is going to deal with the matter. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Jefferson and Honorable Members. Okay, thank you very much, Minister. Honorable Mente, we are in your hands. Yeah, Mandy Bulele Chepesin. Um, the Wuli Sebum Duongo Koyo. Uh, Chair, I hear the remarks of the minister, and I'm hoping that when we are closing, uh, he would then take us through his consequence management up on. Uh, the NSF and who is being held reliable for the mess that it is in now. I'd, I would like to hear that from him. I hear that he is undertaking a review. That's welcome. But when you are reviewing something, it's because of the signs that you are unhappy about all the malfunctions in the system. And therefore in addressing those malfunctions, you ought to also take reasonable steps to rid yourselves of all the elements that are hindrances or will not help you in achieving a desired outcome. So I'm, I'm, I'm not saying he must answer now when he is giving his closing remarks, uh, he can tell us, or if a uh, chair it suits you, he can give a response now before I start. Uh, no, I think let's, let's get the hearing first uh, so that that does not preempt us uh, because okay. what we want is to probe the answers ourselves. Yeah, it may right. help the men as well as he said so that right, so let's you just head in dive into the hearing yeah thank you very much Shepherd. 
And there was an indication earlier on that the DG is with us. I didn't get an indication that the CFO is with us. Can I confirm that? The, the CEO was confirmed. I didn't hear the CFO. Is the CFO with us? Uh, 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 thank you, Chair. Yes, uh, Chairperson, uh, the CFO is with us now. It's an acting CFO uh, at the present moment. Thank you. All right. Okay. Uh, the next question I would like to know is how long the CEO, uh, from you, DG, the CEO and uh, the, 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 the acting CFO, and when did the other CFO leave? How long have they been with the entity? Thank you, Chair. The, the, the management of NSF uh, as constituted under the accounting officer uh, is having a few executive positions, one of which uh, is the CFO, the CFO of which has got uh, quite a number of uh, staff members that he are working with uh, him or her. So the CFO was there, I think resigned at the end of December, and then the new one has just come in, I think it's about a month or so, but the executive officer can actually clarify that particular matter. And the point that you are raising, honorable member, is actually talking to some of the areas that uh, the AG has picked up in respect to NSF operations, of which is the question of the capacity uh, of human resource in various areas at NSF because their work in the main is project-based. Uh, no, Chair, Chair? Yes. So- no, I just need close. I just need to know wh how long have they been there? We'll get into the other answers you are giving. The elaboration for now is not required. Let's not deal with the period. How long have they been there? Uh, the- Executive officer can assist in this. I think it's about a month or so. From DG, how long have you been in the in the uh, higher education? And then account for CEO and the CFO of the NSA. Uh, I've been here. It's the tenth year now. Okay, DG. Yes, honorable member. Now, a DG, who's speaking? Gandhi? Is it the CEO? Mr. Who's DG. Oh, it's oh, Mr. Kond, the DG. Yes, you, you, you're not asking your pieces. Yeah, DG, 10 years. CEO? I've Chief been here Secretary. for 10 years as well. 10 years. 10 years. Okay, the CFO who left. The CFO FO who left uh, was here for seven years. When did he leave? He left at the end of December, 2020. So 2020 days. Thank you very much. My next question would be, we, we all understand the law that governs the expenditure framework and budgeting of South Africa when it comes to the public funds. So if I take you to section 86, 
which is part two of the PFMA. It prescribes the conditions under which offenses and penalties are therefore invoked. So it says an accounting officer is guilty of an offense and liable on conviction to a fine or to imprisonment for a period not exceeding five years if that accounting officer willfully or in a grossly negligent way fails to comply with the provisions of section 38, 39 or section 40. Do we all agree? Yes, we agree. Mm -hmm. Now let's go to your audit report of 2018-19. AG gave us your audit reports in respect of the five, four previous year and the current one, uh, which gives us five audit reports. The last 2018-2019 report, you had serious root causes. And one of them was that the annual financial statement, paragraph 27, it is on page 130 of the 2018-19 annual report, financial statements submitted for auditing were not prepared in accordance with a prescribed financial reporting framework as per the section 55.1a and b of the PFMA. Again, 2020, 1920, raises, Auditor General, she raises the very same root cause. And in this case, it makes it worse and much more difficult for the Auditor General to express any opinion on the finances of the AG. So, in that case, DG, what happens? I want to hear it from you. What happened when an auditor general cannot make any opinion, cannot express any opinion? Do you agree with the statement that the AG could not express any opinion? And if you do agree, what, why was it the same state as it was raised in the previous year? Yeah, you, you are quite correct, Honorable Member. Uh, when this matter was raised in the previous year, uh, which was also, amongst other things, based uh, on the lack of capacity at NESFAS, what then I put out as the accounting authority after I was briefed then by the management was that one, the management must put into place processes of capacitating NSF because it's a rapidly growing organization as identified by AG so that it can be able to have a human resource that would be able to be hands-on on projects. Uh, secondly, in the meantime that that process is being rolled out, they must also appoint the services of a service provider uh, to actually come to the party uh, to mitigate the challenges as identified by the AG in the 2018-19 uh, audit. So that uh, was put to management and the, then uh, the engagements had to actually ensue towards ensuring that it does happen. And I think in that respect, the management can actually give quite a good account uh, in respect to those processes. But those are the measures that uh, I actually thought would be quite important amongst others to assist uh, NSF to build that capacity, which was identified by AG. Because AG doesn't just identify they also look at what might be causing 
this to happen, of which this question of capacity came to the fore. Hence then, I actually insisted on those measures to be put in place. And the, in that respect, uh, it's a process that from the side of being an accounting authority is properly documented. Thank you. I'm happy that you are happy with the rollout and how your process unfolded. But come 2019, 2020, after you've acted on the AG's findings for 2018-19, the same situation occurs and the Auditor General this time says, I cannot even get myself to express an opinion because what I'm finding now here is worse than what I found in the previous year. So which process were you actually happy with? Which did not deliver anything because if the AG was unhappy completely now to a point where they can't even express an opinion, it then tells all of us that the findings of 2018-2019 were not actioned. So your happiness was short-lived. But I want to understand then now, do you disagree with the AG when he says, I got to the institution, I'm actually much unhappier and I'm dissatisfied with the status of financial statements I'm finding here and I cannot work with them all together. So do you disagree with that when you are saying you are happy with the processes that you've rolled out in order to mitigate the AG's findings of the previous year? No, I did say I'm happy. I'm, I'm saying, uh, Honorable Member, those are the interventions and measures that I actually put uh, forward. And uh, in respect then to this, uh, upon follow-up, was I engaged on this uh, question of the finding. One of the biggest areas where NSF is the funding, it's in the TVET colleges, as well as other government departments. What then happens? That is the explanation that I get from NSF, but uh, the management is here, they can elaborate on this particular matter. So whilst they were still in the process of uh, appointing service providers to actually come in and assist in these areas, it also coincided with the review that the minister is talking about, of which then uh, that process couldn't be taken uh, quite further. But the issue uh, that uh, uh, is at play here, NSF gives a funding for training to a TVET college. Then they enter into an agreement with a TVET college. Now, what apparently happens in some instances, a TVET college would go out and hire the services of a service provider uh, to roll out this training for the TVET college. Then they manage the relationship and the work that a service provider would actually be doing. Then that becomes a third party. Then NSF, then in their interaction with a TVET college, that's what AG is, is picking up. They were not able to extend their monitoring and sourcing of documentation from a service provider, which is appointed not by NSF, by a TVET college. So that, those are some of the issues that are actually coming up. Hence then, amongst other things that I insisted should actually be done at NSF is the complete review of the standard operating procedures so that 
uh, the gaps that are in there in respect to monitoring and accountability from those who are assisted with these funds is actually tightened up. But it's the space then that uh, the management would be having more substance on because uh, on operational matters at NSF, I do not feature, I feature in so far as ensuring that the required policies and governance issues are actually addressed and attended to. Thank you, honorable member. Uh, DG, I'm hearing you and I think we're going to agree, me and you. 15, year 15, 16, annual report, 16, 17, and 17, 18 annual report. The institution of uh, NSF had um, qualified audit reports with findings, but you started regressing 18, 19, 19, 20. You were there for 10 years. So this whole life, this five years has been within the institution and you've been there. For you to have implemented whatever new processes you implemented, there was a regression. And what are those areas of regression you've identified and corrected? Let's just say we can accept that you regress 2018-19 and the minister came and started his process to assist. But then it became worse. But three years prior, there were no major issues. There were issues, but there were no major issues. What went wrong, DJ? Uh, the explanation I got uh, from management when I was actually probing this matter, one uh, is that the volumes of projects grew exponentially, the capacity uh, of human resource, especially in the project management unit, as well as in finance, remained very minimal. Uh, thirdly, the approach of AG, which I think is good, uh, that identified NSF to be one of the entities that would be introduced to a new form of auditing by AG, which is risk-based, meaning therefore the manner in which they are auditing it would have a drastic departure from what they were initially processing. Because you'll find that some of the issues that they have been uh, talking uh, about in terms of the findings are the issues they looked in the prior years and they didn't have a problem. But this time around, because of the new approach they are adopting, they have picked up some gaps that require uh, a follow-up. So it's, a, it's that matter that he actually came out. Uh, then that's what, amongst other things, then prompted uh, from the 2018-19 uh, that uh, there should be a rigorous review of the standard operating procedures, and they should be aligned with what the AG has actually raised and the development of those would require some assistance so that is done quite uh, speedily and uh, quite extensively uh, to cover the variety uh, of scope within which NSF is operating. Uh, some of which is in deep rural areas, uh, not just the urban because the more you are urban, the more systems are actually in place and the uh, IT systems are quite uh, manageable. Uh, but the further you go to rural areas, 
uh, you encounter some challenges which require uh, some uh, human resource because everything is paper-based in the main. Uh, and uh, there is no infrastructure in some instances. Uh, from the standpoint then of the accounting authority. So those measures and uh, directives to the management were actually put up. Then the question of to what extent the management has executed, I think they would be able to uh, clarify those issues. Uh, I'm just clarifying from the standpoint uh, of uh, being an accounting authority, not the accounting office. I'm the accounting officer of the Department of Higher Education uh, and Training, which is having a lot, you know, itself. Thank you, Honorable Member. Um, Honorable Member, before you proceed, um, because this is a hearing, there's a request that uh, those responding to questions, um, please turn on your cameras. Um, for the purposes of the streaming that Parliament is undertaking. You can proceed, Honorable Mente. And goes to Chair. Uh, not, uh, Chair, I, I would like to hear the explanation of the CFO. What went wrong? Three years. 16, 17, and 18, there were no major issues. Now the reason is that the scope of work became bigger and much more bigger. But let's take note of the fact that it doesn't matter how much big is the scope of work. There is still a law that we have to follow and comply with when it comes to spending a cent, a one rent, a thousand rent, any amount of the public purse. Now, one reason has been put forward that the scope of work changed, but it did not then say, no one should now comply with the law. CEO, so what happened? The scope of work changed, but AG could not express an opinion now in 2020. So when did the scope of work change? And when did you take a, a decision to not comply with the law? Over to you. Thank, thank you, Honorable Member. Yes, the scope of change from the audit point of view did change. And the National Skills Fund did not uh, uh, go out to say it would not comply. As the DG was indicating, one of the processes that the National Skills Fund uh, uh, realize would need to happen, especially after 2018-19, where there was the first regression in the entity. It became quite clear that going forward, the level of detail and level of documentation that the entity should seek from the skills development providers especially government institutions and our TVET colleges, is going to be much more than what we would normally bring to the offices of the National Skills Fund for record keeping. And on that basis, one of the actions that the entity took following an advice we gave to the uh, account, to the, uh, accounting authority is that the entity does not have sufficient capacity to undertake some of the work that is going to be required in order for it to meet all the requirements as expected. Such capacity, especially from the project monitoring point of view, is, is needed as a matter of agency. 
it was then on that basis that a process to procure the services of external parties, whilst the entity is still on the other hand, parallel to that would be a, a, a bringing in more capacity for ongoing uh, project monitoring. Unfortunately, the, due to the review process uh, that uh, minister uh, uh, sought to have on the entity, uh, that particular process had to be halted. But that did not leave out the fact that the entity did not have sufficient capacity to make sure that at all times it is able to uh, source the sort, sort of documentation that is required at the point where the activity is taking place. This documentation has always been accessed through the audit process where the SDPs, the skills development providers are, because it is mainly information that is uh, related to the transactions that the skills development provider enters into with the third parties in the delivery of skills development programs that are delivered, be it at a college level or through the partnerships that the National Skills Fund has with national government departments and also provincial government departments, and in some instances, municipalities. Now, I, I hear you, the C CFO, but my question is still not answered. And if the scope of work becomes bigger, it means more projects are added. And we are all uh, welcoming the fact that this was mostly based on um, the TVET infrastructures. We are big fans of education, that's fine but it does not exonerate anyone from doing the right thing and account for any expenditure. It's very good to do all those infrastructures and everything, but if they cost us more than what is expected or people are spending money willy-nilly, it cannot be accepted. Let me take it to one instance. Perhaps it will be much clearer and much better to respond to it than to respond to the general problem. AG says, under your skills development, $2.5 billion could not be accounted for. That's on 2020 annual report. 2019 annual report, the same finding was made at 2.4 billion. He further makes a clear indication that out of the indicators that you have and the targets you planned, out of the 22 of them under the skills development, 13 of the 22, there was no evidence that the money was spent and nothing could prove what you say you have done. That raises a very serious concern, knowing how corruption is in South Africa. Because it starts by refusing to show or producing an invoice in which you've spent a money as proof that indeed you've covered expenses for government in a project assisting the people in terms of service delivery. What happened in that instance?
why were there no documents to prove that you have spent money? Uh, thank you, Honorable Member. I would like to point out the fact that there were areas where the National Skills Fund and the Auditor General could not agree on the sufficiency of information that is provided. All the evidence relating to the expenditure that is incurred by the National Skills Fund is available. Part of it is kept in the National Skills Fund, specifically the, or the invoices that are between the skills development provider and the National Skills Fund, as outlined in the MOA. And the evidence is then verified on a quarterly basis by the National Skills Fund. And that verification happens through the visit exercises before the project manager signs off on any quarterly report that, can, that then gets processed by the National Skills Fund. Both finance information relating to that particular project when it has reported and also performance information. Upon that verification, there is a triggering of either a payment or a non-payment. And in other instances, it would be a non-compliance with that particular skills development provider. And whenever non-compliance is found in the process of verification, that particular skills development provider is meted with consequence management letters that outline the areas where the skills development provider has not complied with what is required in terms of the MOA entered into between the SDP and the National Skills Fund. No payment on the records of the NSF has ever been made without this particular process. The report received from the activities undertaken by the skills development provider and that report being verified by the project manager and the project manager undertaking the site visit in which uh, it is, where this in the site visit, part of the work that is happening is, to, is the verification of the invoices, particularly those invoices that the National Skills Fund has no direct control over because it is an interaction or a contract between the skills development provider and the third parties that work with uh, the skills development provider in the provision of the skills intervention. So in so far as the expenditure that is associated with skills development implementation in the National Skills Fund. These reports that make up our quarterly monitoring are in place, are there, but we do agree on the fact that some of the evidence that the AG required, we were not able to present it to the AG only on the account of the fact that that information has never been collected by the NSF who sit in the offices of the NSF. But through the invoice verification exercises, which during other audits that have been undertaken by the Auditor General, such invoice verification at the point of the skills development provider has been undertaken and such invoices have been proven to be valid and related to the activities of uh, the skills development provision. Thank you, Honorable Member.
Ah, I see. You. There is two defense mechanisms we've just indicated. One being, there is a level of a service provider that works with uh, whoever is implementing a project for you. And in that space, you then cannot be accountable for what happens. Number two, you say where any official cannot produce proof that they have utilized the state money, there are consequences meted against those individuals. But at the end, you're saying you found everything and it was found to have been conclusive evidence that money was found. But AG has got a contrary belief and a finding that's completely opposite to what you are saying. So in a nutshell, you are saying you've done everything and the AG's finding is not what is within the status, according to your knowledge, of your institution. So which one is which? Uh, thank you, Honorable Member. I'm actually not saying uh, we are not accountable. Accountability, yes, we are. What I was saying is that we are not collect collecting that part of the evidence, or we have not been collecting that part of the evidence because it is evidence related to a contract between the skills development provider. In this case, it would be let's say a TVET college and any other third party that the TVET college works with in the delivery of the program. Yes, the AG is correct. They have every right to also see that particular evidence. We are agreeable on that particular fact. But the reality that was in place at the time was that the National Skills Fund had not collected that evidence. Whilst in the past, we were able to be at the site during the audit process with the Office of the Auditor General, and the Auditor General would also undergo the same verification exercise that NSF officials undertake when they go to the sites uh, doing the site visits. Because in the site visit, one of the things that gets carried out is the verification of any invoices and ensuring that the work that is being reported by the skills development provider can be found on the ground. And also verification of the learners and, uh, and that the learning is actually taking place in the specific Tibet college. So that exercise we used to undertake together with the office of the auditor general. But some of the complexities of the previous year were that many of the institutions, including the Tibet colleges, were on lockdown. And in the process of them opening up, not everyone was available to provide the kind of access that would NSF relied on to effect the payment. Those invoices have been effectively verified. And that verification also goes with the work that would have been undertaken in the form of performance. And that verification that, and that gets undertaken by the National Skills Fund is the only tool that the NSF uses to trigger any payment or even a reporting of that particular a transaction between the National Skills Fund and the Skills Development Program. Thank you, Honorable Member. Honorable Member, just one second, because I think that's, let, let's not cloud issues here. Uh, so that <clears throat> CEO, in 2018-19, you had findings on accruals, trade and other receivables, 
reliability in so far as um, predetermined objectives is concerned. The one I note here is material misstatements in financial statements and consequence management. This is 1819. All those issues and more were repeat findings. So the issue about this being a lockdown and that doesn't hold. There was no lockdown in the 1819. So I just thought let's not venture down that kind of road of obfuscation and excuses and so on. These are repeat findings. And so now when you try and, 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 and sort of want to create a narrative for understanding in so far as lockdown was concerned, whereas there was even extensions provided in National Treasury made announcements to this effect that there would be delays in the submissions and so on and so forth. It was precisely because it had to accommodate the reality that we're in a lockdown. But be that as it may, these are repeat findings. So I just thought I want to make that point um, so that we, 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 are, we are on the same page, that as this committee, we are not accepting any reason anchored in the so-called lockdown reality. Compliance is compliance, and the space for agility for you to find yourselves in this environment was created. And, and, and if you are unable to do so, that on its own speaks to shortcomings on your part. All right. Thanks, good honourable man. Uh, thank you, Chair. I think Oha Debe also wanted to make a follow up on this particular one before we close. Oh it. yes. All right. Ph, uh, over to you, but. No. Th thanks. Thanks, um, Chair. I am concerned with the response that says all invoice paid have been verified, yet there's 2.5 billion that could not be verified. I think Honorable Mende asked this question and it's not been answered. The continuous response is that all invoices have been verified. What happened to the 2.5 billion? And give us a detailed breakdown of how do you verify invoices? Where is the 2.5 billion? If indeed what you are saying to us, it's true that you do not pay without verifying. And the monies that you have been paid to the service provider, subsequently the third party has been verified. Talk to us about this 2.5 billion. Uh, th thank you, honorable member, and uh, thank you, chair. In relation to the first matter that the chair is, is raising, yes, chair, we are not using the matter of uh, the lockdown as uh, an excuse, not at all. And also the findings related to the 2017-18 financial year, where it talks about uh, at the let me check. Uh, where it talks about accruals uh, and uh, also trade and uh, other receivables. These ones in the main relate to non-reporting by some of the skills development providers that the National Skills Fund uses to deliver on skills development. The lack of reporting that the National Skills Fund experienced with some of the skills development providers, particularly the state-owned companies, which we use mainly to deliver on artisan development due to the capacity the, these institutions have. A number of them were not reporting and were not reporting on time, mainly due uh, most of the times to the fact that they have been delivering 
on what is required by the National Skills Fund and provide us with certificated learners who have passed trade tests for their respective artisanal programs. However, from the point of view of reporting, we struggled quite a bit, resulting in many of these accruals that we had to recognize in the books of the National Skills Fund, also resulting in trade and receivables that we had to recognize in the books of the National Skills Fund, because the monies that would have been paid by the NSF to some of these uh, state-owned companies would not be recognized as an expense until a report is received. Many of them report on the, on the completion of uh, the, 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 the training that the National Skills Fund has paid for. And upon that reporting, the NSF is then able to transfer this trade or this uh, trade and receivable that it has recognized into an expense, recognizing the fact that the delivery has taken place, certification of learners has happened. Yes, you are quite right. It's a repeat, a, 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 a finding which uh, still remains because we still do work with these institutions and many at times they do not report on time even though they do undertake the exercise up until a point where they now want to claim from the national skills fund which is mainly the only time that they tended to report so in this instance the nsf has also issued a whole lot of non-compliance letters all the way to the highest officials in these different institutions and we have received a lot of reports and as a result if one looks at the current year in so far as trade and other receivables and accruals are concerned there has been significant improvement such improvement is also recorded in this current year of 2020-2021 on the matter of the 2.5 billion that uh, the AG indicates that it has not been accounted for. What we are saying is the contracts that the AG looked at during the 2019-2020 period are the same contracts that were looked at in 2017-18 because over 60% of the work that we do, we do it with TVET colleges and the other with the 26 universities and the others probably less than 10% with skills development providers. The TVET colleges contracts were entered into, which is the phase two of our engagement with uh, TVET colleges in the rollout of uh, occupational programs. Started, the, the, the phase two started in 2017. And when we went through the audit process, the documentation that proved the existence of an activity of training of young people was provided. The same that we used in 27, in 2018, in 2017-18 was also the same one that was used in 2016-17, similar one that has been used in 2018-2019. Most of those contracts that we have with the Tivet Colleges only came to the end in 2021 which is at the end of 2020, because the, the NSF is starting the third phase of that rollout of occupational programs with Tibet colleges. The difference, which is what I tried to explain, insofar as the approach of the AG, 
which is also what the DG tried to explain, is that the National Skills Fund going forward, which is something also when we picked up in the audit of 2018, 2019, already indicated that there is now going to be a requirement for the National Skills Fund, not to only uh, utilize the information or the invoices that it receives from the skills development providers as the proof of a payment, but we also need to go deeper to underlying source documents, which would therefore include any other source document related to the delivery of the service that the NSF pays for. According to the, uh, to the circular that we then sent to skills development providers, we outlined that this underlying document, these underlying documents, which the National Skills Fund in all the other years where it, it got unqualified reports, when we used to access them, where the skills development provider is, would then be required to be in the premises of the National Skills Fund. And to that effect, we then said to skills development providers, they should put together this information. For instance, if we talk about the learning delivery, that would include your learner attendance register, which is a normal thing which we do also keep in the National Skills Fund. The, the list of facilitators, the assessors, the moderators that would be involved in the delivery of that particular service by the skills development provider or the TVET college. The contracts of employment for the facilitators, assessors, moderators, the payroll reports and other human resource related reports that indicate the fees that are paid to facilitators, assessors and moderators in respect of the learners that are funded by the National Skills Fund. So these sort of uh, requirements, including the proof of payment for fees to facilitators, assessors, moderators, indicating the bank details where the fees were paid into the assessment and the moderation, the moderation reports that would be put together. The learner portfolio of evidence, a portfolio of evidence many a times, which would be in the form of three act lever files. We then said to all the SDPs, they should prepare this information, but looking at the amount that is involved, it would be important that it is made available within two days when it is required uh, for audit purposes. Because a lot of this information, the National Skills Fund would not have storage to, 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 to keep it. This would be applicable to all the learners that are funded by the National Skills Fund. Be it a learner in the Tibet College or in a university or in a, in a skills development provider for a learnership or for an apprenticeship. So this underlying these underlying documents, which in the past we have always accessed post the verification process at the premises of the skills development provider, we were not in a position to provide the AG these documents here at the office. But all the other documents that we've always provided the Auditor General in the past were in the office and remain here in the office of the National Skills Fund. But that does not take away the fact that the scope for verification that the AG has since required has changed for the National Skills Fund. And therefore we have to adhere to that particular requirement. 
Then in terms of capacity as well within the National Skills Fund, it was therefore important that we undertake an exercise of acquiring services of, an, of a, a, a external parties to assist the National Skills Fund to ensure that whatever documentation is required at any given stage, the National Skills Fund is able to provide it on a blink of an eye. So that is how far we have gone as the organization in trying to meet the enhanced standards from an auditing point of view, which we truly appreciate. We are not saying that there is anything wrong in the new approach that has been adopted by the Office of the Auditor. Auditor. Thank you, Honorable Member. Uh, Chair, sorry um, to want to take over from Honorable Mente, but Chair, th this, is, this is seriously concerning. So you are saying to us in the past, you receive invoice and then you process payment and then later you, ought, you sought to get relevant documentation to that effect. Now you have 2.5 billion uh, uh, missing or that cannot be verified because of your mother's operanda of only relying on invoices, process those invoice, later on go and look for proof that indeed what we have paid has been delivered. That is seriously, seriously concerning. Leave the issue of Auditor General only demanding now that all these must be uh, uh, at your disposal. It's something that ought to have been done long ago. You cannot only rely on invoices for payment and then later verify. I find it that chair highly unacceptable, even if in the past uh, 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 Auditor General uh, uh, saw that as a normal thing to do, it, it, it does not occur well with us chair in terms of oversight for public pests that you will rely on invoices and then later verify. So what in essence it means, you, when you are now doing the later verification, you can't account for the 2.5 billion, hence it's not verified. It's for 2018, 2019, you still have not verified it. What simple means what you have paid based on the invoice when requesting that information, that information is not there because of the mismatch in how you process fine. The question is, how do you do your project management? I am a product of a, 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 a skills transfer to your, 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 your sitters. In all these trainings that I've attended where they were run professionally, the first day it's dedicated to administrative processes. We sign all documentation before we could even start with our training, a representative from the department always come and gives an opening remarks. So I can't understand when you're saying in your case, what was seen as a norm and as a standard is only to verify after. What is your project management practice in this case? Who authorizes or see it as okay uh, that you only uh, satisfy yourself with the amount of the invoice, then you process payment. What is clearly an evidence here is that that 2.5 billion, you could not verify. It could be possibly, I'm not saying it's the case that such a, a training did not take place. How long are you going to uh, take to verify this 2.5 billion? Thank you, Chair. I'm no longer going to this. All right, let's get a response to that. I'm sure Honorable Mente doesn't mind. Thank you very much, Chair, and uh, uh, thank you as well to Honorable Member. Uh, Honorable Chair, I did not say that we pay without verification. The process in the National Skills Fund is that on a quarterly basis, all the skills development providers provide their quarterly reports. 
the quarterly reports that is received by the project manager is then processed in the national skills file. The next step of the processing of the quarterly report is undertaking of a site visit to undertake what we refer to as invoice verification. Because where there are claims that are involved as in the invoice that needs to be paid to the skills development provider, before the payment is processed by the NSF, the underlying set of invoices that would have been claimed by the skills development provider, either as a result of the work that has been charged to them by third parties or any other payments that they would have made, which are part of the invoice that the NSF has to process. That must be verified by the National Skills Fund as a project management process that is involved in the NSF. This standard operating procedure of the National Skills Fund also points to this effect. The standard operating procedure that is involved in the finance environment also points to this effect, where no payment can happen at finance if those steps have not been ticked as having taken place. So the invoice verification does not happen after the invoice has been paid. In fact, if anything, this is the main reason many a times that the NSF is found wanting in terms of paying within 30 days, because there has to be the undertaking of the invoice verification before it is paid to the skills development provider. Because through that invoice verification, the, 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 the project managers are also able to pick up things that are not related to the delivery of the skills uh, program or of the intervention that is being paid for by the National Skills Fund. And such adjustment have to be made on the invoice and it must be signed for between the skills development provider and the project manager and then verified by the project manager, by the project director in the National Skills Fund for it to be paid at finance. So that is a process that has been followed at all times. Where I do say the AG with every right it has, when it then required that this set, this set of originating source document ought to have been presented at the offices of the National Skills Fund, in spite of the fact that in the previous engagements where we would undertake the invoice verification at the premises of the skills development provider together with the auditor general, when it was not happening in the year under question, it is understood on our side that it is every right of, this, of the AG to do that. But that does not on our side leave out the fact that we do have invoices that have been verified that indicate what work has been happening in the different uh, skills development providers and the different colleges that have, for which the National Skills Fund has paid. Yes, in our processes and also in our monitoring processes, a lot of gaps have been picked up. And many of those gaps are directly related and linked to the capacity constraints and capacity issues that the National Skills Fund has. Hence also, we rely a lot on working with the partners that also are governed in terms of the same PFMA, which is our Tibet colleges, these uh, state-owned companies, and also the government departments who also are on an ongoing basis provided with a practice note that exists between the National Skills Fund and National Treasury 
that guides these institutions that receive funding from the National Skills Fund in terms of how they should account for it, both on their end and also insofar as the National Skills Fund is concerned. Thank you, Chair. Honorable Mente, back to you. Thank you, Chair. Now, see also, if, you, if this is your explanation now, are you saying the AG did not acknowledge the existing invoices or evidence to prove that you have spent the 2.5 billion? Which, by the way, is that it come, if you are saying now, you have a system and the, your system is working as we have explained it. Are you now saying that the AG rejected those readily available invoices? Thank you, Honorable Member. No, the AG did not reject uh, uh, the, or the, 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 the documentation that we provided. Instead, they emphasized that it was not sufficient documentation. It was not sufficient evidence because their interest in the main, which is a valid interest, uh, which we also accept, which we are also putting systems in place to give effect to, uh, the, 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 to, to those requirements, is that they require the originating source documents. The originating source documents, which would include any work that would have been undertaken with the third party by the skills development provider that the National Skills Fund is involved with. For instance, uh, if one were to talk about uh, the third party, what does it mean? When certain goods and services that would be procured from third parties, goods that would include things like stationary, uh, consumables, was in many instances when you are undertaking a, 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 an apprentice program like a, a, a welder, there are all those consumables that have to be purchased for the learners in order for them to, uh, to be able to undertake the training practically. Equipment as well, toolkits, the PPE, in many instances, especially in artisanal world, the PPE is one of the very, very important uh, 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 elements that the skills development provider has to purchase. The medical costs, insurance uh, costs, uh, these are the things that all skills development providers would purchase. And many a times when they purchase these things, if we talk about a, a college, the college that has National Skills Fund students, they do not only host NSF students, they also have their own students that are funded through uh, the national fiscals. They also have other players who have students in the Tibet colleges. And when colleges purchase all these items, they don't purchase them specifically for NSF learners. Uh, NSF learners in a particular college, maybe a thousand learners, maybe scattered in the different uh, campuses. Colleges and other many skills development providers, when they undertake a purchase of goods from third parties, they purchase them in bulk and provide them for the delivery of training in their premises for all the learners. And when they deliver a particular course, even the, the, the the, the, the facilitators, assessors, and uh, moderators, they don't give a lecture to 
to an NSF student only. They give a lecture to a variety of students that may be coming from different funders, including those that are funded through the fiscals. Similarly, the assessment and the moderation of the work undertaken by all these learners is not done only just for the NSF. So the process of invoicing to relate it directly to an NSF learner is the one that in the past would be verified through a direct engagement at the premises of the skills development provider. Because we would not be able to say to the service provider or to a college, give us a specific invoice of the stationary or consumables or equipment that was specifically purchased and invoice directly for the, for, the, for the project of the National Skills Fund. The other elements would be the contracts and service level agreements between the skills development provider and that third party supply. Our understanding, and which is an understanding that has carried us over the past, is that these would be the documents that would sit at the premises of the skills development provider, which through the invoice verification exercise, which the NSF also undertakes, would also be accessed by the Office of the Auditor General at the point of engagement when the, 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 the visit is undertaken uh, from a selection of uh, skills development providers that the, 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 the AG would uh, want to see. So all in all, uh, uh, honorable member, the AG did not necessarily uh, uh, say the information is immaterial, other than to say for them it was insufficient evidence because it lacked this further detail since we do not have this detail in the premises of the NSF. In fact, with one of the, of the skills development providers that had a thousand learners, which fortunately happened to be to be, to be head office here in Gauteng. To provide that level of detail in terms of the learner portfolio of evidence, just for one project, we had to hire a truck and then hire a room here in the building to bring all that sort set of, set of evidence, which was then placed in that room full of all the files. That, that was one project for 975 learners. This is then the sort of evidence which at all times would be accessed at the premises of the skills development provider, which we are not saying it's not supposed to be accessed or is not supposed to be there. We are quite agreeable to the, uh, to, 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 to the reality of any sort of evidence that should prove the incurrence of an expenditure has to be accessed and be reviewed. Thank you, Honorable Member. We, we, are, we, we are cycling in one place and we are, we are agreeing with you that it should have been there because prior years did not have major issues as far as your financials are concerned. But these two last years, you started having issues of serious nature that the AG cannot even express an opinion. And you agree now that those documents should have been there. Whose failure is that? You've been there for 10 years. You know the standard practice and you know what is required by the AG. Hence, you have never had major issues before. And in the last two years, you started regressing. Whose problem is that? And whose failure is it? 
who failed to do the proper work and carry out the necessary uh, uh, tasks to collect information and make it readily available. Because we must also know that AG does not catch you off guard. You know the periods of collecting information. You also undertake your quarterly audit within the institution to ensure that every quarter is accounted for. You don't wait for the whole year and you start collecting. You have the information all over. And Chair, I want to say this before I forget it. We need to get an indication from or a, or a list from, 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 from the NSF that gives us all 13 indicators where the information could not be found. Why should we have that exercise? Is to exactly see when was the project and who was responsible for it and what happens when a person is not bringing forward the necessary information. So whose failure is that CO that 13 areas were not accounted for, 2.5 billion was not accounted for. And seated here, I'm not convinced that you have verified that information and therefore AG says it's fine, but we need more. Yes, you need, AG needed more and that you knew because it's proven in the prior years that you've been doing the same thing and you've been doing it correctly. Whose failure is it now that you drop the ball? Uh, th thank you, Honorable Member. Uh, Honorable Member, on this uh, uh, part, the signals in 2018-19, in, in terms of how the approach going forward is going to be, and also what documentary evidence should now be at the premises of the NSF. A triggered a response on the part of the National Skills Fund to say, well, if uh, all that which under normal circumstances would be verified at the premises is now going to be required to be at the premises of the NSF. There's a whole lot of things that we need to look at, starting with storage for the documentation that will be coming to the building, and also looking at the capacity from the point of view of the NSF in collating the information uh, that would uh, be uh, documentary evidence that should be kept in the premises of the NSF. And to that effect, uh, we then sourced or sought to procure the services uh, of uh, external uh, 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 providers that would come whilst the NSF would then beef up its own capacity internally. Because as you would also take note, uh, uh, honorable member, the, from an administration a cost point of view in the NSF, why is one may look at it as, and, and believe that uh, there is a sufficiency or effic efficient, efficient use of uh, uh, funds uh, in the NSF in so far as administration is concerned, because currently is under three, under four percent. Uh, of the 10% that is allowable. But it gives a false indication in terms of capacity because that is indicative of the fact that the capacity at the present moment is not at the scale uh, that uh, would enable the institution to effectively undertake this added responsibility of ensuring that all documentation in this particular regard, even documentation relating to third party engagements by the institutions that work with the National Skills Fund. So to that effect, we then put up this uh, request to make sure that 
there is additional capacity that would assist the institution uh, to be able to have all the documentation in place uh, because we do know that the documentation is there. And in the previous years, at the engagement of verification at the premises, this documentation would always be found. But in this particular instance, for it to be in the offices of the NSF, it then required a whole lot new process that needed to be undertaken by the institution. Yes, the institution took longer to have the right kind of capacity in order to undertake that particular exercise, leading to a situation where we would still have to rely on the fact that the information must be accessed at the premises of the skills development. Chair, I'm, I'm, I'm just hoping that the AG is here. I need AG to clarify something. When we met with AG, there was an indication that uh, they have uh, done site visits to obtain certain documentation. Because now the explanation is shifting that AG wanted the information to be at the NSF offices, not as it used to be when they couldn't find anything. Can AG uh, confirm if they had undertaken the site visits and found the documentations on sites, or even when they have gone to the site visit, they did not find the required documents to prove that money was dispersed and that money was also utilized according to the prescripts of the PFMA. Chair? The other AG may proceed. Um, thank you so much, Chair. Um, thank you, Honorable Mentor. Um, I think from our side, um, I, I will clarify again. We never in any way say that all the documents ought to be in the premises of the NSF. That's not our expectation. We understand that, that is not practically possible. We did go for, for project visits for NSF similar to what we did in the previous year. We highlighted, we came back, We've given management the feedback of what did not work on the site. And as part of closing the matter for this year, we also said to management, for this project visits to work and work effectively, there ought to be a representative from NSF in all instances that can take responsibility for the documents that are required. From for the AGSA perspective, we do go to the SARS, we did went to the site, and we do not expect all the documents to be um, stored within the NSF premises. All we're saying is that it is the NSF responsibility to ensure that when we get to the sites, those documents have been produced to verify that the learning had taken place and not just an invoice that the money needed to be paid. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you, AG. Now we can, we can, we can see someone in your department, which in this case, you ought to take responsibility did not do what they are supposed to do because AG confirms here right now that there's nothing that have changed in terms of their standards of auditing. What changed is your office and where the documents to prove that money was utilized did not do their work. And then it leaves us with a suspicion. If there are no invoices to prove that, money was spent in accordance with the law. There is an element of corruption that could be picked up and that could be that could lead to serious uh, 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 issues in terms of a mismanagement of funds. Now what I'm going to find out, AG says that was them trying to find a solution but it didn't change the standards of auditing. And therefore it means that even when they went to the sites where you are claiming you have not collected in all the sites, even when they visited those particular sites, the information was still not there. So who is then misleading who? And I'm again asking who did not do 
what was supposed to be done in order for OAG to find all the information that will lead to you getting or lead to them expressing an opinion according to the audits. They went there, they spent the money and no one could give them sufficient information in order for them to do their work properly. They left without expressing an opinion. So who's, who, who dropped the ball? Uh, thank you, Honorable Member. As the AG is indicating, there were inefficiencies in this process of the AG uh, visiting the projects. Hence, we had a discussion and agreed on the process and the way forward in terms of how we can gain maximum benefit, both as the entity and also as the Auditor General. When visits of this nature are undertaken. The colleagues of the AG did go to the projects, some of the projects, and uh, their visit at the, at the projects, there was no one from the National Skills Fund. And uh, with there not being any person from the National Skills Fund, they also did report the fact that there were challenges that they experienced in that particular regard. In fact, what was uh, an anomaly in this particular visit was the fact that the Office of the Auditor General attended to it without the support of the National Skills Fund. And uh, we do also agree on the fact that uh, the inefficiencies that ended up being there in that exercise may then have led to some of the expectations of the, of the Auditor General not being met. But we also still did undertake the exercise as was required by the Auditor General's office of bringing the documents to the office. We hired a truck, we brought the, all the documents uh, as they were required by the office of the Auditor General in order for them to go through the documentation uh, that involves all the proof that required that was required in order to make to to deliver an opinion on that particular on that particular project that they required information for so to the extent that we were able to provide this information because some of the projects happen to be in Gauteng then the NSF went out of its way to ensure that it incurs that additional cost to bring the, 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 the files and then to return the files to the skills development providers. Because for certification of the learners at the end of the day, all these original files ought to be accessed by the quality assurers that eventually do the certification of the learners. Thank you, Chair. Chairperson, um, I just want to bring it to your attention that everything we ask, there's a new answer for it. And it's unfortunate then that we are not in, in even in the physical meeting where probing is much better than these screens. Um, I think we, we, we need, because AG could not make an expression uh, uh, and cannot give us any conclusive evidence of how the money was spent within this institution. And therefore, failing which uh, we need to get a certain investigation happening in the NSF. I hope the minister is still here because now this leaves a very bitter taste in my mouth. I can't even continue to ask about the project approvals that were not done in accordance because that is also gonna be shifted on. It's a project that took place somewhere and those documents were not sufficient for the AG, but according to us, we did it correctly. It also goes to improper record keeping. That is also gonna be shifted to the same thing. So the root cause as the AG for them not to express any opinion is has an answer. But that answer is not to the satisfactory 
of this committee and also myself, my observations is that I'm not, I'm not satisfied. If they say they have done it, in one of their answers they provided uh, on their document was that we have started the, de the deferred expenditures, accruals, creditors, everything, and we have submitted all these documents to the internal audit on the 19th of April, 2021. That's after the, the AG has done everything and the AG says there is a huge concern where NSF is concerned and we cannot work with their financials, but they claim to have financials. I think the office of the minister and uh, the DG, we need another investigation into this particular um, institution because I'm not satisfied with the answers. I am suspicious of potential corruption or even a worst case scenario where even those particular projects that are being indicated here could not be existing at all. So Chair, I'm resting my case from here. Thank you very much. All right, uh, thank you very much, Honorable Mente. Um, Mam Tolashe, is your network fine? All right, let's take a whistle. Good morning, okay. Honorable Chairperson, uh, Minister, Honorable Members, Officials. Good morning. Honorable Chair, my, my, my network is not as good today. However, I am going to try my level best. Let me start by thanking you for allowing me to be part of this. Chair, first and foremost, I would want us to, to raise my concern before I ask questions or just to, to reflect a bit. I, 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 I heard the opening remarks of the minister. I appreciated them. But Chair, as I appreciated them, they gave me a lot of goosebumps on whether what you are going to do today or what we are supposed to do today will bring us anywhere, having heard what the minister was saying earlier on, but also experiencing the interaction between the entity and honorable men in particular. We might have to ask questions and engage. However, I'm not sure if we're going to make any breakthrough given what the minister said and what we're experiencing at the present moment. I really would want to check whether our colleagues, the Portfolio Committee on Higher Basic Education are here so that they can hear themselves. And really when we find time, we must meet and, and, and interact and find a way on how best are we going to deal with this matter. Chair, I see a situation where we are dealing with something that you are not going to be able to resolve. I know and quite convinced with the work that has been done by the AG, but I'm extraordinarily worried by the fact that the very people who are supposed to own up are beginning to be everywhere else, except for where they are supposed to be in owning up on what is the AG's outcome insofar as their responsibility is concerned. Okay. I would also want to, when the minister comes back, to hear from him, I heard him saying he had interaction with the different stakeholders that are working directly with this entity. I would want to hear from him whether he managed to get to hear from the very important stakeholders in this matter, which are students whom we know for a fact that they are in the gates of the institutions. Young women are seated there, very cold nights, exposed in 
gender-based violence because of this leadership that is seated here that does not have a plan on correcting what they've been doing in the last years, but also not demonstrating any capabilities to be able to take this institution forward. And I will humbly request, Chair, that we consider a more serious process where we'll be able to get to the crux of the matter on what is going on here. There seems to be a bigger problem than what we can see in front of us. There's, we hear serious inconsistencies in the responses that we are getting from the CEO. We heard from the minister that she, he hasn't been there at a particular time, and now he's here, he got to realize that indeed there are problems. And in that regard, I would want to hear from minister whether in the, what the president is, is expecting of the ministers, fruitless and wasteful expenditure, uh, horrible ages reports. If Bangagaskobi Senje, whether the president does look at that insofar as minister's performance and he had anything to do or say insofar as that matter is concerned. I'm raising this matter, Chair, because the President of the Republic has committed himself to fight corruption and he took the South Africans and taxpayers' money in confidence that he'll be doing that. But from where we are seated, all that we are presiding on is serious corruption. I don't know if this is not corruption, what it is, where officials cannot account on the taxpayers' money that have been spent not in one financial year, yeah, I'm sorry, but in more than one. But this thing is happening just later in the life from where we are, something like four years ago. The entity is crumbling, literally, Chairperson. And we can't sit and, 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 and fold our arms and, and really pray and hope that something is going to happen. We can punch holes in the, in the responses that the officials are giving. But for me, that is not enough, Chairperson. Let's get there where the problem is. Let the minister commit to say he must do something that the AG himself or herself, this time she's a woman, she cannot do by making sure that within 30 days, the minister brings in a forensic and get to receive those reports <clears throat> and get to hear and know exactly what is the problem. At the same time, stretching to all the machinery for him to act on the wrongdoing that would have been picked up. We are not confused on the fact that there will be wrongdoing because as you can hear the responses from the official, you can hear that whilst the CEO with due respect speaks on parables, it confirms that there are bigger problems than we can see. So I would want to, to appeal to you to say, let there be a commitment from the minister for him to commit here and now to say, indeed, something serious and more drastic is going to happen. Because my worry, you, you know, church will be AG, I, I really, be about Vela. People get into serious jobs with the understanding. Now, when the Auditor General is doing his, her work, now people don't cooperate for obvious reasons and run around and demand this and that. When that outcome comes out, people have got audacity to contest that. Whilst the, we know now the ages processes are not a once-off. It's a long process. Now you wonder why people would have audacity to come in this portfolio committee to come and deny or play games with the Auditor General's report. It's not acceptable. It therefore points to a situation where we are dealing with bigger problems here. We are dealing with serious corruption here. 
The only thing we need to know where, by who, and then make sure that the state institutions that are responsible are made to come in and do what they are expected to do. If the CEO give these kinds of, of responses to, to the lower officials from, he, from where he is seated, we will be just wasting time by punching holes and putting questions because we are not going to get anything different here. Chair, let's call upon the minister to take us into confidence whether he's going to put the forensic investigation here so that we can quickly get to where the problem is. Chair, we can't once again have this thing. Since uh, the biggest strike of students after 1976 took place, we, we, we don't seem like we have learned anything from that. From where I'm seated, the, the entity and the department might have been able to learn and now better they are. But it is getting worse. It means as the country, like the, 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 the fees must fall, this thing, we are going to stay with it for the next coming two, three years or five years, which is something that is not, is not, not very acceptable. For the fact that che, this is playing into the cold face of our problems and challenges in South Africans. And the minister coming from a particular political organization in the manifesto, this thing is in the center. And I'm not sure how is he going to explain himself on the failures that you are picking up on this. And the exposure that you have put our young people whom are coming from the most poorest areas who are interested in wanting to take their lives and their education into higher uh, heights and having a government that not seems to care, but doing as they wish at any given time. I am really perturbed, Chair. I really would want to, to appeal. I know the effort that we put in place for you to prepare and have these meetings, but I have a, this feeling that we're not going to achieve anything here, Chair. Because if the CEO is giving these answers, who else is going to give better answers that will direct us to the why there is this fruitless and wasteful expenditure and who is are their consequence management if the ceo cannot give us the answer who else so chair sorry to take this long i'm appealing we're not going to get anywhere let's get to hear from minister what drastic steps is he going to take for us to be able to see this thing changing for the good and make sure that he hears from everybody, students in particular, so that we don't get into what we were in, in the last five years. But Che, it's like it's happening on a daily basis. Even now, in the institutions, we'll find their students who are still seated there, not knowing whether they are, if the money is there or not. And they exposing, especially young women, into a situation that I don't think CEO is aware of where they are exposing to gender-based violence that would take their lives into where no one would want to see or know. So, right. Thank you very much. Uh, all right. Uh, thanks, Mam T. Um, can Babu Samia? Um, one of your child colleagues, uh, the minister and the DG, uh, the so I, I think uh, Honorable uh, Tolashe has uh, um, uh, taken the words out of me um, on the appalling uh, nature of the state of the institution and um, uh, that, that we give the minister uh, a, 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 a tight timeline uh, uh, in terms of the proposition uh, to um, uh, conduct some um, uh, uh, thorough um, uh, uh, audit in a forensic uh, instance uh, 
which which would come back uh, to the uh, committee on the on the findings, uh, something which should be done not later than a thirty day uh, period. Uh, uh, that that would uh, enhance his uh, view uh, of a total review of the institution, so that he should know which direction um, is the best uh, around this matter. Asking question, this other question, and that other question, it it takes us into more confusion. Uh, let's, let's, let's rather tro- throw it back uh, to the minister uh, so that uh, he could uh, 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 somewhat uh, uh, set up a, a, a team to focus on such and get back to us uh, in the next uh, 30 days. Thank you very much, Chair. Babuso, may I still And community, community chairman, I'm true. You threw, okay, I thought you had, yeah. you had cut. Uh, yeah. All right, colleagues, are there any further hands? Because I, I think we must just, um, all right, honorable men, and then I'm also gonna make a conclusion and I'll hand over to the minister afterwards. Right, honorable men, eh? Uh, thank you, Chair. Now, uh, I just want to remind the minister of my earlier question on what consequences does he have in place for whatever it is that he has um, found and which actually prompted his intervention, the earlier intervention he indicated. And then um, in addition to what uh, Baba Somio and Mamti are saying in terms of the investigations and the 30 days that we propose that we give to the minister, I want to check with you, Chair, what are the chances of us involving the SIU in this matter so that it can also kickstart its own processes. And then finally, because there is an indication from the CEO that documents now have been found in everything. I just want to find out what is then the stand of the AG on these documents that are apparently resurfaced and are accordingly what the AG is requiring out of them. What could be done now by the AG in order to check what's happening in the in the, in the NSF, and is there a possibility from the age side that they could also kind of like implement a process where NSF is concerned? Because we have a serious issue where education and the infrastructure here in South Africa is concerned, that the AG can do the same process as it did with the PPE and um, implement a kind of a real-time audit to keep up with how the expenditure framework and um, budgeting of NSF uh, is done properly and proper beneficiaries are in then uh, accordance getting what's due to them. Thank you, uh, uh, Chair. All right. Well, colleagues, um, Minister DG, let me just say um, we, we are wholly not satisfied with the responses. Um, and I think that is why you are getting members coming to making a proposal so early in the, in the hearing. Um, and it's because the gravity of the situation and the gravity of the uh, state of collapse, really. The regression is just phenomenal, to say the very least. It's of epic proportions, um, as we have seen, it, it's, it, it, and, and is of cause of great serious, serious concern to us. So uh, as, a, as a means of bringing this to a logical conclusion, the Minister, as the colleagues have said, we are proposing that uh, a full-scale forensic investigation be undertaken into the affairs of the National Skills Fund in their entirety, in, with a particular focus, of course, to 
the last three financial years because that's when the regression seems to have kicked in and the collapse which we see now the situation is just uh, undesirable and untenable as things stand now <clears throat> and of course this uh, will dovetail with the uh, audit and assessment that you have um, undertaken and then minister for you to um, give us a report 30 days from today uh, on how the process of the forensic investigation will be structured uh, including but not limited to cooperation and liaison with the SIU um, so that we can actually get to the uh, bottom of this. The responses are all over the place um, and they are not reality bound but question bound in terms of what has been asked now and then there's clashes, it's sh shifting. Uh, the, the situation is just not acceptable. Um, Got individuals in the entity for 10 years. Um, Honorable Minister, I will hand over to you with that proposal uh, to say we would like a roadmap by yourself with the urgency that it deserves within 30 days in terms of how the process and structure of a forensic investigation will be done. And the SIU who are here um, to, uh, uh, to assist Scuba, Germana, scuba. Chair, we can't hear you. It's a bit of an apology. I'm going to be completed. So I welcome the deputy minister as well. Honorable uh, text, please mute your mic. Am I audible now? I was just intervening because we couldn't hear you, Chair. Okay, you can you hear me now? You're breaking up terribly there from Encanta. I, <laughs> you, yeah, I'm not, I'm not from Cal. Right, let me keep my camera off because maybe there is a connection problem. But what I was saying really is, Minister, the responses are not satisfactory. The audit outcomes are not satisfactory. There is a massive regression um, and adverse audit outcome with a long list of findings. Uh, the state of affairs at the entity is one of serious concern and speaks to uh, a collapse of systems and governance and the instability in leadership, particularly at CFO level, draws our attention. I would have wanted to zoom into that, but colleagues have circumvented the issue quite precisely and correctly. We would like, Minister, within 30 days, you submit to us a program or a, a program of action or a plan of action in terms of how a forensic investigation is going to unfold and the SIU to cooperate with that, that issue so that we look at all these issues in their entirety uh, with a particular focus over the last three years but not limited to those but we point out the last three years because that's when you pick up the regression uh, coming in uh, the DG and the CEO have been there for 10 years. They are part and, parcel, part and parcel of the entire body politic of the institution. And so they are going to be good reference points uh, for this investigation. But at the same time, these regressions have happened under their watch. And so we are placing this uh, at their doorstep and wanting far more comprehensive answers in the form of a full-scale forensic investigation. We will make a determination in terms of how long we are giving that investigation once we have received the plan of action that you'll be rolling out, uh, Minister. And so we hope that this will receive the agent attention that it requires. And the concluding issue of saying this, <clears throat> the Deputy Minister had uh, an, an engagement earlier on and he had submitted an apology. As soon as it finished, he joined us. And so we welcome him as well. He did join the meeting uh, whilst we're on progress. I just want to step that. So DM, welcome to you as well. Minister, let me hand over to you then. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Chair, my church. 
and uh, to honorable members. Uh, let me start by answering uh, honorable members' question. Who do I hold responsible? Of course, from my own standpoint, it's the DG as the accounting authority of the NSF. That's where I should go. Precisely also because of the issues that have also been outlined here. By saying so, I'm not saying that I'm finding anybody guilty, but uh, in terms of consequent management, that's where I should go. But Chair, there is something that uh, <clears throat> I did not raise at the beginning. And I don't want then that you start the meeting from scratch, which has been of concern to me from my earlier stint, by the way, as Minister of Higher Education and Training about the NSF, which is a matter that I am still committed to address, is that the Skills Development Act, I think a scope I should have an interest in this. There is, there is somehow, the Skills Development Act does not sit easily with the PFMA and the Public Service Act. Because the DG, in terms of the Skills Development Act, is the accounting authority of the NSF. At the same time, he is accounting officer of the Department of Higher Education and Training where the NSF should be reported. So you have the same person performing two different roles as accounting authority of the NSF and at the same time as accounting officer of the department that actually where the, the NSF reports. This is a hugely anomalous situation because in a way, it, it's, it's like the same person reporting to himself. So the law is one thing that will need to be addressed. But that does not depart from the fact that the DG is the accounting authority. And as you say, Chair, I must hold responsible and accountable on this score. I hope that answers Honorable Mentor's question. Maybe just a few more comments, Chair, without taking much of your time, is that uh, just as you do, I also view this in a very serious light. And what I have already been doing, apart from the other measures that I take and review, which by the way, I had requested 20 months ago, uh, that this process be started towards a review. Now, the, the, the other thing that I think that, that by the way, not I think that I had taken, I had already started four weeks ago to get in legal advice on the meaning and the possible implications of this audit outcome and what particular actions needs to be taken. Now, I had not concluded, but I've been engaging with the, the lawyers and I, we were close to concluding, but then we said, let's allow Scopa then to reflect on this matter. Then I go back to the legal people for consequent management in the light of all of this. So that's also what I've been doing over the last four months. I've been in contact with the lawyers so that also I'm able to be guided legally, you know, what is it that could be done here and, and, and properly. Now, just to clarify uh, to Honorable Member Comrade Sisi, I, I think maybe she might not have heard me properly. I've not been interacting with the stakeholders of the NSF. I want the review process will inevitably have to interact with some of the stakeholders of the NSF as part of looking at the operating model of the NSF. I also hope that that review will also include a sample of the projects that they might want to look at 
a little bit in depth, not from a forensic point of view, but from the point of view of accountability, functionality, and so on. As I have said, if I don't see a forensic investigation as being in contradiction with the review, because the review has got a very specific task, which I think it's important, whether you have a forensic investigation or not. So that is what I should have said. Now, Chair, let me say I do accept your recommendation as well as the 30 days that you are giving me. I will have them to seriously apply my mind on this matter and then come back to you to tell you within the next 30 days what I have done and what I still intend doing. Thank you very much. Okay, no, thank you very much, Minister. I think the issue that you raise in so far as the DG and the accounting officer roles, as you've put it, was that issue at the top of my mind as I was preparing for this hearing, um, because it, it, it does sit as a, a peculiar arrangement on one hand, uh, and on the other hand, one is a test case as to how things can be improved. I think let us um, probably interact with our portfolio committee colleagues uh, and look at that legislation and also Minister, uh, assume that um, the forensic investigation and the review, which we believe dovetail, may make a recommendation around that particular matter as well to say how do we resolve it? Is it uh, something we continue uh, allowing or if there needs to be legislative changes uh, we look into? So let us hold it in abeyance to allow these processes to run their course so that we make an informed decision on the basis of what would have been very thorough work. So I think colleagues, let's include that as part of the uh, 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 issues that we want um, actually looked at. And then, uh, colleagues, I think we can bring the matter to an end there uh, for now to say that uh, we are going to get that report. And of course, we will be a, a meeting even during the recess period as this committee, but not as frequently, but that permission has been granted to us, one of the committees that can meet during recess. And so some of these things will conclude at that point. Uh, when we, we have received it. So I think colleagues, uh, that, that, that should be fine. Um, let me just check if there are any other hands. Uh, um, all right, there are none. So colleagues, let's leave it at that to say that uh, we will receive a, a report in 30 days. And Minister, I think as I was saying, your, your, your assessment and audit process dovetails with this investigation was the investigation you are proposing, we'll be looking at the nitty gritty issues. The, the, the assessment is looking at the broader overarching issues in terms of structure and so on. And the AG and the SIU will be, at least from our side, the points men, uh, points people whom we'll be talking to, to drive this process. And of course, we, I think colleagues, we may have to rope in national treasury as well, at some point on the accounting officer phenomenon, so that we provide as maximum clarity uh, on, 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 on that issue. So colleagues, in the absence of uh, further hands, let me take this opportunity to thank the Chair. minister. David. Right, Honorable Hattebe with an H. Um, th thanks. And um, Chair, excuse my, my, my ignorance. Um, I would have loved to hear more in relation to the predicament posed by the act in relation to an accounting authority who subsequently is an accounting officer of the department. So that also in, on our side, when we engage at least, we have a sense of what are the predicament and challenges that uh, are posed by the design of the legislation in, in, in this regard. So if we can just uh, give us a sense, a, a brief synopsis in terms of um, what then becomes the, the, the challenges. Okay, uh, Minister, can we get that and then maybe it can be put in writing as well, uh, if you can expand on that particular issue. 
Uh, honorable Chair and, and, and Honorable Members, I would, I would be more than happy to provide a brief write-up to send to you on this, but to try and explain this simply. The Skills Development Act says the NSF has the DG of the Department of Higher Education and Training as the accounting authority, which is an equivalent of a board. Accounting authority, you often have boards. And then below that, you then have a CEO. So the issue then that this poses is that in terms of the PFMA, the DG of the department is responsible, is the accounting officer, which means for all, all of the department is the accounting officer who then reports to me, but also, also reports to me as accounting authority insofar as the NSF is concerned. Now, the unease that is there with this legal arrangement is that it could be a situation, not to blame an individual, where the DG is reporting him to himself because matters have to be processed also through the accounting officer of the Department of Higher Education and Training, who is the DG, who at the same time is the accounting authority like a board, which means that accounting authority reports to the accounting officer and then to the minister. So that just that, that doesn't sit well legally. That is the issue, but I can be able to write a brief, maybe with the necessary legalese, which I do not have. But to explain it simply, that is what it is. Thank you. Um, Honorable Adeba, are you covered? I, I'm, I'm, I'm covered, Chair. Um, I think you're correct. We, we will have to get um, a deeper analysis and the sense of um, the quagmire uh, that, that posed by this current arrangement and a, a, a legal opinion in this regard will also assist and how we will move forward in resolving such uh, an arrangement legally and uh, in compliance with all the pieces of legislation at our disposal. Thank you. Okay, maybe let, let's do this. Let, let's also refer this matter to our own legal advisor Sister Put Ben, can you please just uh, advise legal of this inquiry that we have in terms of what this means? And we will consolidate it with what the minister will provide, what the audit to, or, or will, will give, and what will be the findings of the, um, the forensic investigation so that we take an informed decision. I think that's what we need to drive it um, so that whatever legislative changes are required if they are any uh, they are they are based in in in, in, in a concrete uh, assessment of issues so i think uh, minister if in the the submissions you will make to us at the, in 30 days if that write up with the necessary legalese uh, as well can be included we'll also be doing our own and the comparing and sharing of notes will become instrumental uh, in, in that regard colleagues May I thank you very much for uh, your attendance and participation this morning. I know that there are budget votes and we are juggling uh, those with committee meetings. And then to say tonight at uh, 1800 hours, we will commence a hearing on CETA uh, and on their financial uh, outcomes and their audit report. And then, uh, so I think that meeting is um, 1800 to 21 100 hours tonight, and then we'll meet again tomorrow. So uh, without any further issue, the meeting uh, stands adjourned. And thank you very much, Minister, Deputy Minister, DG and CEO, and the team, SIU and AG, as always, an absolute pleasure. Uh, we'll meet tonight. Thank you very much, colleagues. Thank you very, thank much, very much, everyone. Chair. Keep on keeping you safe, yeah. Chair, and everybody. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Long live thank the Chair. chair. I, I was about to ask. Long live the chair. I was about to ask. Cheers, colleagues. Cheers, bye, colleagues. <laughs>